Well, good morning. It is a joy and a pleasure to be here. You know, as we look at God's word, I'll hold it up and I'll tell the kids, you know, the Bible is a big book. There's lots of stuff in it. And part of Jesus' ministry, a lawyer asked him, Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus responded, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind. And the second is to love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus summed it up that that really, if we boil down all of God's word, we're to love God and love people. And there's lots of instructions on how we're to love people, whether it's fathers and mothers or children to parents or even within the church, believers one to another. But one that's often neglected is the commands that God gives to love those that don't love us. We read a couple of these commands in in Romans chapter 12, verses 17 and 18. God's word says, Never repay evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Or what about the words of Jesus in Luke 6? Jesus says, But I say to you who hear, love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. And if we're honest with one another, we all struggle with this. We know the standard that God has called us to, and yet so many times we fail. And just think back in your life and your experience, whether it's family or whether it's coworkers or neighbors, isn't it hard to love people that don't love you? Maybe somebody ripped you off or somebody had a, a rude word towards you. But God's word tells us that we need to be kind to those that are unkind to us. And the question is really how? How do I do that from the heart? I could maybe go through the motions, but God doesn't really care about the motions. What does God look at? He wants the heart. So how do we get to a place where we could just really love people from the heart, whether they love us or not? And God's word gives us a great example of this, an extreme example of loving your enemies and pursuing peace and doing good to those who hate you. And this example is given to us in the life of King Saul and David in 1 Samuel 24. And so I'll invite you to take your Bible and open to 1 Samuel chapter 24. And as you're turning there, it's really important that we really kind of set the stage and get some background. 1 Samuel 24, David is on the run from Saul. He's fleeing for his life. But if we go back to the beginning of David and Saul's relationship, it begins in chapter 16 when David's musical skill is heard by one of Saul's men, and this man suggests, hey, why don't we bring David in to play music for Saul? And David does on occasion go and play, and it comforts Saul. In chapter 17, David is sent on an errand by his father to check on the welfare of his brothers who are in battle. This is where David sees the giant Philistine Goliath And David accepts the challenge and he defeats the Philistine and he's promoted to serve within Saul's royal court. He becomes one of Saul's army officials. He's a war hero from that point on. And so we have these first two chapters, 16 and 17, that take David from being just a a lowly shepherd boy into serving the king, being a hero. Everyone in Israel knew about David. Everyone respected him. And we turn to chapter 18. Chapter 18 really is is the key chapter in David and Saul's relationship. It's the hinge on which the whole relationship turns. In chapter 18, as Saul and David are coming in from battle, and the people are there to celebrate, and the women sing their song, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. And Saul becomes jealous with David. It says in chapter 18, verse 9, that Saul looked at David with suspicion from that day on. It says in verse 12 of chapter 18 that Saul was afraid of David and that he dreaded David's prosperity. 
Verse 27, it says that Saul was even more afraid of David. He was jealous. He was afraid. He was threatened. And in chapters 19, 20, and 23, on three separate occasions, Saul's own son, Jonathan, the heir to the throne, sides with David against his father because David is righteous and Saul is being unrighteous and it infuriates Saul even more. And so as chapters 18 through 24 build up, you see this building of Saul's jealousy, Saul's anger, Saul's violence towards David. We see the contrast of David's character building as well. In chapter 19, we see that Jonathan reasons with his father and he says, Father, why do you want to attack David? Why do you want to harm him? He's been beneficial to you. He's risked his life for you. And so we see that David is innocent. In chapter 20, verse 32, Jonathan again asks his father, Father, why do you want to harm David? What evil has he done? And the answer is, there's nothing. And not only is David innocent in the midst of Saul's jealousy and Saul's attacks on David, we see that David is excellent. Chapter 18, verse 30, it says that David behaved himself more wisely than all of Saul's servants. It's not just that David met a minimum standard, you know, acceptable service to the king. He was more wise, more well-behaved, a greater asset to Saul than any of Saul's other servants. David, he was excellent. And even the king, I'm sorry, the, the priest, Ahimelech, he refers to the king, he says, King Saul, why do you want to attack David? Who among your servants is as faithful as him? The answer is there's nobody. There's nobody that's as faithful as David. David is innocent, he's excellent. And we see this contrast between David's character and Saul's. And we see in these chapters, 18 through 23, we see Saul's anger erupt towards David in violence. And 11 times, Saul attempts to murder David. Can you believe that? First time in chapter 18, where David is playing music for Saul, and Saul, unprovoked, takes a spear and hurls it across the room at him. David flees. Again in chapter 18, Saul cooks up a plan. I will entice David to, to marry my daughter, and I won't require a dowry of money. I'll just send him out to kill some Philistines. And Saul's reasoning was, I'll have David take great risk, and so he'll fall by the hands of Philistines. And David is so humble that when the king approaches him to marry his daughter, David says, I can't marry your daughter. I, I, I'm just from a lowly tribe, a lowly family. Saul again, with a second daughter, says, David, please marry her. And David goes out and he defeats twice as many Philistines, brings back proof, and the scheme backfires on Saul. And so now David is an heir to the throne. David is the king's son-in-law. And it gets worse from there as Saul attempts to attack David and kill him. You know, in chapter 19, we see this how despicable Saul is. Saul sends men to David's house to kill him. And David hears about it. And David's wife, Saul's daughter, says, David, you need to run. She, she lowers him out of a window. And when the men come to the house, they knock on the door. She says, David's sick. He can't, he can't come to the door. And so they go back to the king. And when they tell the king, hey, David's sick, the king says, you bring him on his bed. I don't care if he's sick. You bring him here so I could kill him. So you get the picture of what's going on? Saul is intent on killing David. Is he sick? Doesn't matter. Is he innocent? Doesn't matter. Is he a son-in-law? Is he a war hero? It doesn't matter. Saul has determined to put David to death. And so if we look through, we could see all 11 times that David attempts to, or Saul attempts to kill David. And yet David always responds in a godly way. 1 Samuel 24 gives us an extreme example of opposition and violence that none of us will likely ever face. You know, most of the opposition that we'll ever face will be verbal, insults, sarcasm, someone might 
slight us. And very rarely will people come at you with physical violence. And even more rare than that, would someone come at you motivated to kill you. And so the lessons that we learn from this account, from this passage, really they give us an argument from the greater to the lesser. If God's grace was enough for David to respond to Saul's murderous threats, his attacks, surely God's grace is enough for us to respond to the difficulties we face with grace and with mercy. So let's look down to 1 Samuel 24. Go ahead, turn there with me. Let me read this for us. 1 Samuel 24, starting at verse 1. Now when Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all of Israel and went to seek David and his men in front of the rocks of the wild goats. And he came to the sheepfolds on his way, and there was a cave. So Saul went in to relieve himself. Now David and his men were sitting in the inner recesses of the cave. The men of David said to him, Behold, this is the day which the Lord said to you, Behold, I am about to give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as seems good to you. Then David arose, and he cut off the edge of Saul's robe secretly. And it came about afterwards that David's conscience bothered him because he had cut off the edge of Saul's robe. So he said to his men, far be it from me because of the Lord that I should do this thing and sin against the Lord's anointed to stretch out my hand against him since he is the Lord's anointed. David persuaded his men with these words and did not allow them to rise up against Saul. And Saul arose and lift and went on his way. Now afterwards, David arose and he went out of the cave and he called to Saul saying, my Lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David bowed with his face to the ground and prostrated himself. And David said to Saul, why do you listen to the words of men saying, behold, David seeks to harm you. Behold, this day your eyes have seen that the Lord had given you today into my hand in the cave. And some said to kill you, but my eye had pity on you. And I said, I will not stretch out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Now, my father, see, indeed, see the edge of your robe in my hand. For in that I cut off the edge of your robe and did not kill you. Know and perceive that there is no evil or rebellion in my hands. And I have not sinned against you, though you are lying in wait for my life to take it. May the Lord judge between me and you, and may the Lord avenge me on you, but my hand shall not be against you. You know, when we look at this passage of Scripture, we see that God's word really gives us some really powerful lessons that we can learn from David. And really, the, the extreme nature of David's situation really puts things in perspective for us. The things that we face are, are so much more of a petty nature than what David did. And if we get the picture here, David and his men, they're, they're running for their lives. Not just David, but his men as well. And Saul has al already tried to murder them or murder David 11 times. Saul gathers together an army of 3,000 men. David has about 600 men. Now, with an army of 3,000 men, you can't really sneak up on anything. And so David and his men, they would have been aware of Saul approaching. They would have uh, waited some time to see if Saul was actually coming to their location. And they hid within this cave. And as David and his men are in this cave, you could just, you could just imagine them as Saul's army gets closer, the rumble of the horses. Maybe dust and things are falling from inside the cave and it gets louder and louder until finally Saul's army is literally on top of David and his men since they're underground in that cave. And everything stops, it goes quiet. David and his men holding their breath, trying not to make any noise. And a figure appears at the mouth of the cave. They can just see a silhouette just because of the light outside the cave. And every one of David's 600 men 
have their swords drawn, men with their arrows at the ready. Is this a scout? Is this an informant? And as this figure walks in the cave, they realize it's Saul. It's the king. And he is unaware that we are here. He stopped at the cave. The Hebrew says to relieve himself. It's a polite way of saying he had to use the bathroom. And Saul is exposed. He's alone. He's vulnerable. And David and his 600 men are there. And what's David going to do? He's got a decision to make. And if we look at this passage, we'll see that God's word, David, teach us five lessons how we are to respond to those that are unkind to us. Those that hate us, how are we supposed to respond? And the first lesson is this. Purpose to fear and obey God. Purpose to fear and obey God. David was determined to never raise up his hand against the Lord's anointed. If you look down at verse 6, when Saul is in the cave, David said to his men, Far be it from me because of the Lord. I want you to take a a pencil or pen or marker. I want you to, to circle that phrase, because of the Lord. David said to his men, Far from me, far be it from me because of the Lord that I should do this thing to sin against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. If you look down in in your passage, you'll see that the Lord is used in all capital letters. And when that's used, that's used to speak of Yahweh God, Jehovah God, the Lord God. But when the Lord is used with lowercase letters, that just means a master or a a, a respectful title. We might use it the same way we, we talk about the landlord. And so David says, far be it from me because of the Lord. Who did David fear? He feared God. Why would David not strike Saul? Because David feared God. He was determined to obey him. David said, I can't do this. I can't strike down Saul. Even though he's tried to strike me down, he's the Lord's anointed. And David knew whom he was accountable to. to. If we look down to verse 10, David reasons with Saul. He says, some said to kill you, but my eye had pity on you. And I said, I will not stretch out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. So why did David hold back? Was it because David was afraid of Saul? Was it because David wasn't a good fighter? He didn't think he could win that fight? Was it because he didn't have opportunity? No, it was because of the Lord. He did what was right because he knew what God required of him. And so, we need to understand, that just, Dave, just like David knew this lesson, that sin towards other people has heavenly ramifications. If you sin against a man, you really sin against God. And the scripture is full of examples. You think of in Acts chapter 5 with Ananias and Sapphira, when Ananias and Sapphira lied about the amount that they had given to the Lord Peter rebukes them. He says, why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Now, had they lied to men? Yes, they did. But primarily, when you sin against someone, who do you primarily sin against? Sin against God. And David knew this. My favorite example of this comes in Genesis 39, the account of Joseph in Potiphar's house. And Potiphar's wife looked with desire at Joseph And day by day, she enticed him. But Joseph said, how could I do this evil and sin against God? Now, would it have been sin for David to succumb to that temptation? Absolutely, it would have been sin against Potiphar, against Potiphar's wife. But but, But Joseph said, I can't do this because I would be sinning against God. And here we see that David understands that same truth, that to sin against others is to sin against God. And so when we're faced with opposition, when we're faced with someone that is unkind to us, maybe someone who hates us, if we return evil for evil, who do we sin against? We sin against God. And we need to learn. We need to learn that lesson, that we are accountable unto God and our sins against others. And really sins against God. David teaches us some great 
truths, some great principles to put into practice. The first is the purpose to fear and obey God. The second is to pr protect your life and not your pride. And we've seen this with David, that every time that David was attacked by Saul, he would flee. He would protect his life, but he wouldn't protect his pride. David would flee, but never retaliate from Saul. It was always a defensive move, never offensive. Not once did David pick up the spear and throw it back at Saul. Not once would David counterpunch. Not once would David find out the scheme that Saul has, has laid, a trap, and David lay his own trap in ambush. Not once. See, because David understood an important principle that we should protect our lives, but we should not protect our pride. And look how humble David is. We look down in our chapter. Look at verse 14. As David continues to converse with Saul, David asks, After whom has the king of Israel come out? Whom are you pursuing? A dead dog? A single flea? You see what David does there? He, he depreciates his importance. He says, Saul, you bring an army of 3,000 men to come after me? I'm just, I'm just like a dead dog. I'm like a flea. Saul... I am not a threat to you. Do you see pride in David? No, David, he's, he's protecting his life. He's not protecting his pride. And so oftentimes do, do situations go from offense to bad to worse because people are trying to protect their pride. You think, you think about that. You've seen arguments where people, they just keep arguing. Everybody wants to get in the last word. And they're arguing for the sake of their pride. And David knows this pride is not worth fighting for. He should protect his life. He flees. But David doesn't protect his honor. He lets his actions, he lets his mercy, he lets his self-control and restraint do the talking for him. Proverbs 19 or 29 11, it says, A fool always loses his temper, but a wise man holds it back. And in Proverbs 16 32, it says, He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than one who captures a city. You know, the society is the same in our day as it was in David. Men prize strength. Men prize power. Men prize the ability of to impose their will on other people. But you know what God prizes? He prizes self-control. Being slow to anger. Being able to rule one's own spirit. Not let their temper get away from them. And David understood this. And you see that this plays out in David's life. That he protects his life. But he doesn't protect his pride. And that's an important lesson we could learn is we might deal with those that we have opposition with, those that might mistreat us. We might want to say something because our pride is wounded, but it's not worth it. Very rarely would we have to flee to protect our life, to protect ourselves from physical harm. But even in that case, we see that David, he doesn't protect his pride. He just protects his life. Such great lessons to learn here. First, purpose to fear and obey God. Second, protect your life, not your pride. The third principle, third lesson, is to practice restraint. And we see this as David responds to Saul. Look down at verse four. The men of David said to him, this is after Saul had made his way into the cave Saul had removed his outer clothing. He was alone. He was vulnerable. The men said to him, Behold, this is the day which the Lord said to you, Behold, I am about to give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as seems good to you. The Lord arose and cut off the edge of Saul's robe secretly. And it came about afterwards that Saul's conscience bothered him because he had cut off the edge of Saul's robe. And he said to his men, far be it from me because of the Lord that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to stretch out my hand against him since he is God's anointed. 
And David persuaded his men with these words and did not allow them to rise up against Saul. And Saul arose and left and went his way. When David was in the cave, David had opportunity. He had the approval of his men, 600 men saying, David, this is, this, this is the point where you could end it here for good. You don't have to run anymore. David had the approval of his men. David had already been attacked 11 times. And yet David practiced restraint. That's just unbelievable to me that after so much abuse and mistreatment that David could still practice that restraint. Well, David could do that because he was aware of what God's word said. Leviticus 19, verse 17 and 18, God commands, you shall not hate your fellow countrymen in your heart. You may surely reprove your neighbor, but you shall not incur sin against him. You shall not take vengeance nor bear a grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And David was aware of the righteous standard that God had called him to. David knew that he had to practice restraint because he was not allowed to take vengeance. He was not allowed to hold a grudge. He was not allowed to hate someone who hated him. And not only does David practice restraint on himself, David holds back his men. Could you imagine that? Them in the cave whispering, David, this is the day. Go get them. You could hear them probably like gritting their teeth. You know, they're so amped up. They're so passionate about that. Not only David's life was on the line, their life was on the line as well. But look down at verse seven. It says, and David persuaded his men. I want you to take a pen, and circle that word persuaded. That's a Hebrew word that means tor. David had to break ranks with his men. David tore his men apart. They, they thought that this was the right thing to do, and for David to let Saul go was just crushing to them. David risked mutiny because he showed restraint. And if we look on, it says, David persuaded his, men's with, his men with these words and did not allow them to rise up against Saul. Why don't you circle that phrase, did not allow them. David didn't just hold himself back. He didn't just restrain himself, but he restrained his men as well. And we could look at just something in passing, just a lesson for life. And that's that we need to put providence to the test. You know, it was God's providence for Saul to stop at that cave. But it was not God's will for David to strike down Saul. You know, just because you have the opportunity for something, that doesn't mean that that's God's will for you. And how do we discern between opportunity and circumstance and God's will? It goes right back to scripture. It goes back to... Leviticus chapter 19, you shall not take vengeance. And we need to put providence to the test. Just because we have opportunity doesn't mean we have God's permission. You know, people say that revenge is sweet, but revenge is a forbidden fruit, for God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. As we look at this passage, we see these great lessons just just being lifted out. Purpose to fear and obey God. Protect your life, not your pride. Practice restraint. We could also say put justice into God's hands, and that's what David did. You could look down at what David said in verse 7, or actually verse 12. David says, may the Lord judge between me and you, and may the Lord avenge me on you. Did, did David put vengeance into his own hands? Did he take the coward's way out and say, oh, I won't do it, but you know, if you guys want to do it, you can. Did he put vengeance into his men's hand? No. God put vengeance into God's hand. Because vengeance belongs to the Lord. God knows how to do what's right. So we see that we need to 
purpose to fear and obey God. We need to protect our life. Sometimes we need to flee, but don't protect our pride. We need to practice restraint. The fourth lesson is we need to pursue peace. We need to pursue peace with those who hate us. Look down at verse eight in our chapter. Now afterwards, David arose and he went out of the cave and he called after Saul saying, my Lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David bowed with his face to the ground and prostrated himself. You know, David didn't just restrain himself from harming Saul. When David addresses the king, David goes out of his way to show Saul honor, to show him respect. David doesn't inflame the situation. He doesn't come out and curse Saul. But he addresses him. He says, my Lord, my master, my king. I want you to circle that. My Lord, the king, circle that. Look how far David goes out of his way to pursue peace. And not only that, when Saul turned around after he heard the voice, David bowed with his face to the ground. He, he prostrated himself. He laid out completely on the ground. Look how far David goes out of his way to try to make peace with Saul. And remember, David is completely innocent. And Saul has attempted his life again and again, and yet David goes out of his way to make peace. We could look down at verse 11. David addresses Saul as father. He says, now my father, see, see the edge of your robe in my hand. All of these titles of respect, all these titles of honor. And we see we could learn a lot from David. Oftentimes, and people are unkind to us. We want to be unkind back. There's an unkind word. We want to give an unkind word back. An unkind look. And yet David pursues peace. Look how far he goes out of the way. And pursuing peace doesn't just mean refraining from harm, but actively doing good. You know, the definition of pursue is to chase after. And David chases after peace with Saul. David doesn't inflame things but he diffuses the situation with gracious words. You know, what if God treated us the way we oftentimes treat others? You know, what if God showed patience towards us the way we show patience to others? And what if God didn't go out of his way to make peace with us? You know, for God the Son to leave heaven, he went a long way out of his way, didn't he? God's word tells us that God demonstrates his own love towards us that while we were yet sinners, that Christ died for us. And just as God pursues peace with those that hate him, he gives us the privilege of pursuing peace with those that hate us so that we may reflect his mercy, that we may reflect his character, his patience, his grace. So just as God pursued us with his peace and went to great lengths, God calls us to do the same. And David, David did the same with Saul. He bowed before him. He addressed him as Lord. He addressed him as King. He addressed him as Father. Because David knew that the way to make things right is to pursue peace. Not just hold back from wrongdoing, but to actively pursue. So we've seen these great lessons. Purpose, to fear and obey God. Protect your life, not your pride. Practice restraint. We could also say put justice into God's hands, and then to pursue peace. The last one is to persuade with the truth. Look at what David does as he interacts with Saul. He reasons with Saul that he is not a threat. If you look at verse nine in our chapter, David said to Saul, why do you listen to the words of men saying, behold, David seeks to harm you? 
David says, why, why do you listen to men's words? Look at my actions. When have I picked up the sword and thrown it back at you? When ha have I ever counterpunched? These men say that I intend harm for you, but Saul, when have I ever harmed you? And David reasons with him. He persuades him with the truth. The answer, and Saul's aware of it, that David had not done anything wrong to Saul. Look at verse 10. It says, Behold this day, your eyes have seen that the Lord had given you today into my hand in the cave. And some said to kill you, but my eye had pity on you. David says, hey, see, you've seen with your own eyes. You were in the cave. You knew where I came from. You knew that you were vulnerable and exposed. And yet I didn't strike you down. Saul, why do you listen to men? Listen to the truth. The truth is that I mean no harm against you. David promised him in the end of verse 10, he says, I will not stretch out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord God's anointed. Now my father, see, indeed see, the edge of your robe in my hand, for in that I cut off the edge of your robe and did not kill you. Know and perceive that there is no evil or rebellion in my hands. David holds up the piece of Saul's robe Empirical evidence that he had opportunity to strike down Saul. Saul was aware that David could have been lifting up his head just as he, as he did with the giant. And David says, know and perceive that there is no evil or rebellion in my hand. Saul, I will not harm you. I mean no harm to you. And then David does something that's really powerful. If you look at the end of verse 11, David says, I have not sinned against you, though you are lying in wait for my life to take it. Look at what David does. He, he really shames Saul with the truth, saying, Saul, I will, I will not be a threat to you even though you've tried to kill me all these times. And David persuaded Saul with the truth. David says, I'll never take revenge on you even though you've tried to kill me. And you see that David, he, he persuades. He points to the truth saying, Saul, this is what you understand, but let's set the record straight. The truth is, I have not harmed you. Sometimes as we have dealing with people, sometimes we're innocent. Most of the time we're not. And we could persuade with the truth by saying, you know what, I've wounded you. And I'm sorry, would you please forgive me? That type of truth is very persuasive. God's word says that a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. And so you see that David persuades Saul with the truth. He says, Saul, I had opportunity, but I didn't take it because I don't want to take it. I mean no harm to you, and I will never raise up my hand against you. We don't have time to see Saul's response. But what David does here, it, it really melts Saul's heart. Saul admits, he says, David, you're more righteous than me. David calls his army of 3,000 away. They depart. It doesn't change Saul's heart. But in that instance, Saul responded. So we see these great lessons, these great truths that we could put into practice for those that mistreat us, for those that are unkind to us. And really, it's an extreme example that you and I will never face. We'll never face this. And it's that argument from the greater to the lesser. It's like if, if a bulletproof vest could stop a 44 Magnum, then surely it could stop a BB. And the types of attacks that others might hurl at us, they're just, they're so small. They're so weak in comparison to this, and yet we could learn these great principles, great truths to put into practice.
we have a high calling in how God wants us to treat others. That we need God's help. It's impossible to accomplish without his enabling. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, it says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you in order that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the wicked. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even tax gatherers do the same? And if you greet your brothers only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. High standard, high calling, and yet God's grace is sufficient for us to put it into practice. May God help us as we interact with all people to do them good and to love our neighbor. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that it is good and true. Thank you, Lord, that you teach us lessons of how you want us to live. Lord, rem- help us to remember that you pursued peace with us while we were your enemies, while we were far from you. Your son reached down from heaven and became a man so that he would give himself as a sacrifice to pay the penalty for our sins. Lord, would you enable us to go out of our way to love all people, even those that don't love us. And Lord, we pray this in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.